da, da. <laughs> yeah. Hey guys. How's it going? So this will be my first ever official Dune live stream. So I hope everyone can hear me. Tell me how am I sounding? Can you hear me pretty good? Hear my voice? I know there's somewhat of a delay. So I'm going to wait for you guys to respond. Hey, hey everyone. Bless the maker and his water, indeed. Yep, so everyone can hear me. Okay, cool. Cool. At least I think. I think. Tell me that you can hear me. Okay, awesome, 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 awesome. See, that, that delay is like so intense. It's like, oh my god, can they, can they not? So excellent, excellent, excellent. I am so glad that everyone is here. Um, uh, well, today we're doing a live stream for Dune, which I've never done a live stream exclusively to talk about Dune. But usually, after I finish one of my big Ultimate Guide episodes, what I will do is I'll do a Dune talk video. And I thought, this is the perfect occasion to do it live because I have so many extra notes for Heretics because it's a very multi-faceted story. There's a lot going on. And if you did see the Heretics of Dune video already, then you can tell like it's jumping between planets, between characters and plots. There's a lot going on. Um, it's quite different from the other novels in that way. Uh, most of them are exclusively on Dune or they just jump between one or two places maybe. There's a little bit you know, on, in Children of Dune, there's a little bit on Seleucus Secundus, I believe. Yeah, Seleucia. Is it Seleucia? The planet of House Carino. I'm pretty sure it's Seleucus Seconda. Yeah, it is. So a little bit there on, but here it's like Gamu, there's Rackus, there's Flalax. Uh, it's all over the place. So, and, and so here I wanted to answer a couple of the questions that I was getting after I uploaded the video because I always want to make sure that everything is clear. There's a lot going on, so I get why people miss uh, certain elements of the story because it's very easy to. And Frank Herbert does have that kind of writing style where it's like you, you kind of have to really focus on what he's saying or else you're not going to get it. One big question that a lot of people were asking, and I was glad that they were asking this question because I really wanted to answer it. Uh, they were saying... When Leto said to the Bene Gesserit, when Odred goes in there and she reads, they, when you, and she remembers, she recalls his words, he says, They must call me Shaitan, Emperor of Gehenna. The wheel must turn on and on along the golden path. It's something like that. I don't have the exact quote pulled up, but it's something like that. When I am gone, they must call me Shaitan, Emperor of Gehenna. Now... That is, there's two biblical references here, and uh, Frank Herbert loves his biblical references, like Arafel. Um, but these, these references are more direct than Arafel. So, let's start with the first one. So, Shaitan. A lot of you wondered, what, why are they calling him Shaitan? Why is the god of the desert now being referred to as Shaitan? Well, in the Hebrew language, Shaitan was, a word, was the word for accuser accuser or the enemy, the opponent. So essentially, Shaitan is Satan, the devil, Lucifer, the enemy, the great enemy. Not Leto's great enemy, but the, the devil, the enemy in the Bible. So that's what that's essentially what Shaitan is. So he says, you must call me Shaitan, Emperor of Gehenna. Uh, Gehenna is the second biblical reference. Now, Gehenna was a place in the valley, in a valley in Jerusalem. And it was a place where these kings would sacrifice their children. And so it was a cursed place, a condemned place. So what the God Emperor is saying here essentially is they must call me the devil, essentially, emperor of the condemned, a, a ruler of a cursed, condemned people, a cursed, condemned place. It goes back to uh, the golden path. It, it all goes back to the golden path and later his vision for the future and later his vision for himself. He understood that people had to hate him if the golden path was to work, essentially. He had to be viewed by history as this kind of evil, satanic figure. 
and it, it, it's very interesting in Heretics of Dune where uh, when Shiana when they hear Shiana the priest hear Shiana call him Shaitan and they kind of scoff at it they're like oh my god she's calling him Shaitan because that ca- that carries significant connotations and ultimately the priesthood is is an interesting concept because ultimately the god emperor would be against the priesthood it, like the, the, the priesthood by their very nature work in opposition to the golden path because they are promoting this idea that yes leto was a god yes he's divine and you've got shiana who comes in and kind of subverts that it, it, which is very interesting so and they are met with this very um unique kind of conflict uh between shiana and these uh, kind of heretical things that she is saying and her also being able to control these warrants be able to con- to commune with their god in a way that they can't so uh yeah i'm reading i'm reading some of you, you guys' stuff so yeah so yeah so it, it it emperor of gehenna it goes back to how leto needs to be viewed in history in order for people to move on and in order for people to look back and always fear that kind of ruler and always fear that kind of leader right because frank the, the whole crux of this story is that frank herbert wants us to see through our charismatic leaders that was the ultimate lesson of the golden path leto said to maneo i think in god emperor of doom that i am a predator i need to be viewed as a predator and that's exactly what he is that's exactly what shaitan is that's what that represents emperor of gehenna they must call me shaitan emperor of gehenna and uh, it's such a it's such a Frank Herbert is just such a such a good he he just ha, he just has such a good way of representing the long view of history of of showing us how how over time really history creates its own truth right uh it doesn't it doesn't really matter what actually happened it matters how history interprets that way back in Children of Dune Leto says that the 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 history of this night will far surpass what actually happened here but the memory of it the memory of it is what really matters thank you so much marvin martin for your super chat uh you said if herbert had finished the books how do you think it might have ended what would be different well uh it's really hard to say and i'll tell you what marvin marvin thank you so much for that super chat but i i want to wait until i Put out my ultimate guide to chapter house dune before i make all of my comments on the end of the series and how i think that it would have ended versus the brian herbert stuff because i do think there would have been some pretty big divergences there um but i want to wait until i go through chapter house like i've done to all the other books and really break everything down and really get to the nitty-gritty before i make any conclusions and put anything out there in the universe and definitively say this is what i think would have happened so i I, so basically what i'm telling you is i want to avoid sounding like an idiot before and really really like really like make sure i understand everything before i say anything before i say anything solid Uh, oh presley baldwin says hey there sorry that i have not seen your content in a little while just wondering what your favorite dune story is you mean out of all of the books well, I I have to say that God Emperor is probably still my favorite book out of the six Herbert books. Uh, definitely. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, okay. So that 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 was my uh that's what that's that was my answer on Sh- Leto, Emperor of Gehenna, Shaitan Emperor of Gehenna. So does anyone have any more questions on that little bit before I move on to what I wanted to talk about next? which was what's going on with the Bene Gesserit and all this stuff in Heretics of Dune. So does anyone have any questions on Emperor of Gehenna, or is that pretty cut and dry? Because it's pretty straightforward once you get the references. Once you understand what he's referring to, it's pretty it's pretty obvious. Uh, San Berrios, do I follow Josh Brolin on Instagram? I don't have an Instagram account, but I did see that video of him on Arrakis. It was pretty cool. They're on Arrakis now. They're filming, and it's really freaking awesome. Should the Golden Path be implemented in our world? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, 
see that's such a hard question because i i'm not the one to judge because i am not leto the second i don't have by the way thank you for your super chat i don't i can't look into history i can't look into the i can't look into humanity's past and look into humanity's future to see it for myself so i don't know what's necessary see what's great about leto is that he could look into the future and the past with better access than anyone else so he really knew what was necessary now if i became the super quiz that's had like of the universe and i find i found myself looking into the future and i found the necessary steps to take and i was willing to do it then i guess i i we'd have to create our own golden path right it has to fit our own world so we'll see we could use a golden path essentially is what i'm trying to say maybe not necessarily the one that's in the dune universe Okay, so, oh, more super chats. Thank you, guys. You're so generous. Uh, Marvin Martin, thank you again. Uh, part of the golden path was stagnation leading to extinction, yet human nature and some cultures have been around since day one, and we're still kicking. I'm so confused. Um, but, you know, cultures evolve. Cultures definitely evolve. I mean, even, even though we do have cultures that have been around for thousands of years, I would argue that the vast majority of them aren't the same as they were even like a thousand years ago. I mean, it's very difficult to maintain that exact the same thing for that long, I think, right? I, th I, think, I think it's difficult, I think, to see how much cultures evolve in the long view of history because we only have a certain perspective of it. You know what I mean? So I, I, think, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a civilization that's been around for thousands of years that hasn't changed significantly from the time of its conception to now. You know what I mean? Okay. But great questions, Marvin Martin. You're putting me to work, making me think. Uh, Sean Har Haraku, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, the manu of the ravages of time state the concept that history is written not by the strong, but by the biases of, his stories, of historians. That is, I think that is true. I think, uh, so in, in Game of Thrones, in the Song of Ice and Fire books, which I also cover a lot on this channel, uh, George R. R. Martin likes to present his history through the view of these people called maesters, who are kind of like the historians, the scribes of history. And he makes a point into demonstrating that they have their own biases, and what you're reading from them might not necessarily be what actually went down. And I think that is a very true thing in all of history. It, it, and you see this in Dune as well. In the very first book, we are getting all these like little tidbits from Irulan about Muad'Dib, but we're seeing it through the eyes of Irulan. So can we really trust Irulan to give the most accurate representations of what was really happening in these times? Which is why God Emperor is a very interesting book, because I like to think in my mind that this book is being told. Um, it's just being told from the perspective of what Leto wrote in his uh, in his journals. So it's interesting, like, okay, so this God Emperor could be the most accurate book as far as like, uh, but yeah, as far as like how, how accurate it is and how reliable the narrator is, because Leto has to be the most reliable narrator that you could ask for, right? So that's very interesting, and I, I definitely do agree with that concept, that history is less so written by the strong, because the strong aren't writing it down, it's the historians that are writing it down. So it's the historians that get to shape those little, those subtle little nuances, and um, it, it could be something as simple as a little bit of wording to completely change how someone is viewed in history, just a little bit of wording. Uh, word, word things a little dis different and it's the difference between a conqueror and someone a genocider that's not a word <laughs> genocider is not a word but you you, you get what i'm saying uh, there's not that much difference between like someone that conquered a kingdom and is known by history as a great ruler and someone that's known by history as a genocidal maniac Okay, and Sean Hiraku is following up and saying that, thank you for another super chat, that The Ravages of Time is a Chinese comic about three kingdoms and the era of China, so you can say it's telling the truest history of that era. That's very, very interesting. I'll have to check that out. So many super chats, guys. Thank you so much. I was not expecting this. But does Heretics slash Chapter House uh, tag count as a type of quiz that's had a wreck, or is he something fully new, or how would you categorize his awakening? Okay, so this is a very, this is a great question. I think tag is something new. 
And I like I like what you just said, um, Brian Brennan. Something wild. He's something new. Uh, I I love he- I love Frank Herbert's quote from that interview where he's saying, "What would you rather live in a box or a universe of new surprises?" And that's exactly how I interpret Tag's awakening. It was something that was unexpected. Maybe maybe Leto himself didn't even see this coming. You know what I mean? It was something that was unexpected, something new, something that came out of just like this, out of this wild, crazy universe, essentially. Uh, so it's something new, something that we don't quite understand. Uh, and, and I wish there was a seventh book so that we did have a little bit more understanding of it. But yeah, it's definitely something new. I don't think he's necessarily a Kwisatz Haderach, but yeah. Great, great question. All right, so I wanted to get to something else. So Benny Jesuit, the Benny Jesuit in this book are up to all sorts of crazy, crazy plans within plans, and it gets like, if you're not careful reading this book, it can be like, wait, what are what are you guys up to? What are you doing? But the Benny Jesuit, um, they seldom do it. They they always have layered motivations. So essentially, the way I interpret what is happening in this book is that you have the Bene Gesserit and they are training Duncan to be irresistible to women. And they were going to use Lucilla to imprint Duncan so that he'd be loyal to the sisterhood. And then they would use Duncan to control Shiana is, is, what, is what I'm seeing. They, they, they would use Duncan to control Shiana at a later point. But their plans got all shaken up uh, in the chaos. Miles Tech ended up awakening Duncan before the implementation process could be implemented. And then the honored Matres acted unpredictably. And, you know, it, it, their plans just got, kind of got shaken up from there. So then there was also this plan that Terraza had that was to initiate the destruction of the planet Dune so that they could... The Bene Gesserit would gain control over the spice, not a monopoly because the Tleilak, because the Tleilak Su would be able to produce it in their axolotl tanks, but they would gain um, they would gain control over the spice. As far as because there's a bit in this book I think where it's like the the Bene Gesserit they they are like okay Tleilak Su spice but like the warm spice that's like the real that's like the real deal stuff the warm spice is the good stuff and the Tleilak Su stuff is kind of the off brand essentially. And it was to also dilute the God Emperor's consciousness even further, right? So the God Emperor was gone. He was divided. But his mark was still upon the universe because pearls of his awareness existed in the the sands and they still moved to the tyrant's ancient beat. They still essentially did his bidding. bidding. So Odraid, I guess, kind of was aware of this. And she figured that, in, not Odraid, but Terraza, she figured that in order to remove the Bene Gesserit from the tyrant's grip, what they had to do was dilute his control, dilute his awareness. And so by destroying the planet Dune, they could then gain control of the worms themselves, and they would have time to do what they needed to do before his multi-fragmented consciousness rebuilt itself. And by that point, humans would be expanded to the point where he no longer had control over their fate because Taraz's idea was that it wasn't necessarily that he was predicting the future. He was creating it in a sense. And, you know, I don't necessarily know if Taraz was correct, right? Because it's like, it's like, okay, that seems like that was kind of Leto's plan anyways, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he, see, that, that's the thing. He doesn't necessarily want anyone to have control, even him. So that's why I feel like Odraid in the end truly understood. Odraid understood more than even Taraza, right? Odraid understood that they were really freeing the God Emperor. They were freeing him from this endless stream. Like they were freeing him from his, from his own burden. So yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very, it's very, very, it's, it's, it, there's a lot of food for thought here. It's a lot to think about. But I got a super chat, and I really need to answer this. Six Foot Fetus, thank you so much for your awesome super chat. You were awesome. Thank you guys so much. You're always so supportive. Uh, just want to say great job on all the Dune content. You are truly doing God's work. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it, the kind words are greatly appreciated, and the super chat is greatly appreciated. 
Okay. Q&A, do you think you're pandering too much to the haters and uh, skeptics and the cynics of Game of Thrones series? Your videos haven't been positive as of late. Well, you know, but when it comes to Game of Thrones, it's it's a show that I've been really disappointed by. But you know, my last my I did my last video was definitely positive. I was talking about Cersei. And you know, like I said, next week we'll be reviewing those episodes and you know, we can you know, we'll be reviewing this episode and it it'll be it'll be is what it is. If it's good, it it's good. If it's not, it's not. You know, I'm not I've never been the type of person to be like I like this when I don't like it. So it's like if I like it, I like it. If I don't like it, I don't like it. But if you're in for more analytical Game of Thrones content, it's definitely coming over these next few weeks as the show's going to be coming out. So I'll be analyzing everything rather than criticizing it, I guess. But yeah. Okay, Marvin Martin. What about the pearl in the last worm, you ask? Yeah, exactly. Um, the pearls would eventually come back and split again and, and rebuild themselves. But by that point, the idea is that humanity would be fully separated from Leto's grasp. So he'd be diluted into one worm for a significant amount of time. But then by that point, human is humankind is really spread far. and He has no further grip on the Bene Gesserit or anyone. So, yeah. So basically that. He's diluted. Uh, I still enjoy the TV show. Yeah. What is the best quote from all the books? Oh, that's such a good question. I don't know. That's... That's such a hard one, but of course, fear is the mind killer is an iconic quote, obviously. Uh, there, there's so many. I, I like you are servants unto gods, not servants unto servants from God Emperor of Dune. Because that's taken again in um, Heretics of Dune. And Shiana says you are servants unto Shaitan, not servants unto servants, which is very interesting. Uh, okay. I'm so conflicted. I love your content, but your voice is so soothing it t begs me to take a nap. <laughs> well, I take that as a compliment. I take that as a compliment, JT Rhines. Um, Elio Greenhand issue. I'm not sure I know what you're talking about, sir. Um, but yeah, okay, back back on this. I have a lot of notes for, for um, the Bene Gesserit and Heretics of Dune, which is very interesting. Okay, one, one thing I think is funny in this book is that very early on it's kind of stated that... Uh, it's kind of stated that the sisterhood follows the orders of the mother or superior almost to a fault. They, uh, follow, they follow the mother superior almost to a fault, except when they didn't. It, it it it's kind of, it's kind of a private joke that yeah the yeah the sisters yeah the sisters usually follow the mother superior except when they disagree, which is very interesting because I wonder how long this kind of joke of heresy goes back right so is this something that goes back to before the time of Jessica, or was Jessica's actions against the sisterhood something that was kind of the catalyst for uh, this heretical nature in the Bene Gesserit, right so were Bene Gesserit Regular, were the Bene Gesserit regularly disobeying orders before Jessica? Or did the Jessica thing set off something? And I tend to think that it was Jessica's initial disobeyal in having that son that later set off this heretical nature in the Bene Gesserit. Because then you have like Miles Tegg's mother, who's like a heretic. And then you've got Odrade, who does some heretical things. And you've got Shuang Yu, who's in open rebellion against the Gola Project. So they're very interesting because... Before this point, before this book, we kind of see the Bene Gesserit as kind of like this unbendable, unbreakable structure of women that's kind of impenetrable, almost, and that Jessica was kind of a fluke. But then in this novel, it's kind of like the walls are peeled back, right? And we see that they're not, they really don't actually have it all together, and, and there, there's heresy even among them, Um so that's very, very interesting. So the, it, it's, it gives you an entirely new perspective on the, on the Bene Gesserit sisterhood. Both of these last two books, too, because you learn so much about the sisterhood that you really didn't know before and their nature. And, um, and something that's coming up in Heretic, in, in Chapter House next, which is very interesting, is, that the, is the Bene Gesserit choice, decision to utilize the Tleilaxu Axolotl tanks. Because it's something that initially they were disgusted by, but uh, the honored Matre trays and this, 
these rough times kind of drove them to do something that's kind of to them is kind of an abomination which is to you so that's that's a very interesting something that we're going to get into later in in chapter house of dune so the mini desert what's interesting about them though is that they're pragmatic they're pragmatic they're constantly evolving they're always willing to evolve and that's how they have survived so long that's how they survive through the time of muad'dib and su survive through the time of the tyrant and survive through the famine times it's their pragmatism their willingness to change and evolve and move on mm -hmm. all right i'm just reading you guys this comments now quinn i love your creepy in-depth song by some fire videos i'd love to fall asleep to the, you have a top notch i'd love to fall asleep to you have top notch work thank you so much thank you so much uh, Wyvern Stone says, your encyclopedic knowledge encyclopedic knowledge of the Duneverse is quite impressive. It's nice to know someone that likes Frank Herbert's work, work as much as I do. Be well, dude. Yeah, I love Dune. Dune is something... Dune is not something that I read when I was a teenager. I, I picked up Dune a, a few years ago. I started getting into Dune and I thought, wow, this is one of the most expansive, most philosophical, deepest, most amazing science fiction series that I've ever read. And, you know, making videos really came out of me talking to my friends to death about Dune and them kind of rolling their eyes and being like, what? I don't understand. And I, I, I wanted a way to transmit Dune to a wider audience and make it more accessible. And that's why I kind of came out with the ultimate guide to Dune. And what do you know? It worked somehow. <laughs> it worked in, in, in some way. Uh, thank you so much for your super chat, Don Heim. Thank you so much. Do I think they will do Duncan justice this time around? You mean in comparison to the David Lynch Dune and in the miniseries Dune? Um, I, I hope so. Jason Momoa is playing Duncan, as we all know, in the newer, uh, in the new Dune movies. So we'll see how that works out. I don't know. Jason Momoa could be good. He could be bad. Uh, it, it just all depends. It all depends. It, 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 there's, there's so much that could go wrong that it's almost... Uh, it's it's difficult to say it's difficult to say uh the david lynch movie i am planning on doing a review to that david lynch movie because i do like it i do like the david lynch dune but i think there are some significant problems with that movie uh after the after about the first hour i want to say that movie kind of falls apart so it's kind of you know, there's some iffiness to that and then the miniseries is more accurate to the books definitely but it's very very it's poorly made uh the 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 cgi isn't great but it was early 2000s so they kind of get a pass on that the costumes definitely aren't great the acting is a little iffy the actress that does Aaliyah is um it's not great uh she doesn't understand the role definitely does not because i it, the funny thing is i was actually uh looking at some of the interviews for the the children of doom miniseries and James McAvoy plays late to the second. And he he was a fan of Dune his entire life since he was a teenager. And hearing him talk about Leto was actually great because I could tell that he actually really understood the character. But then the actress that played Aaliyah, I could tell that she didn't really get Aaliyah. And it kind of, you kind of see that in her portrayal of the character. So it's kind of like, eh. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah so yeah but yeah I have seen I have seen all the movies and miniseries though but it's not like can you recommend a great introduction book into the Dune universe well the the only introduction book into the Dune universe is Dune the original Dune by Frank Herbert you have to start with Dune that that's where you have to start you start with Dune and then you you take yourself where you want to go from there I, I um some of the great house books the Brian Herbert ones are are okay. All right, so like House Carino, House of Trades, those are decent. Um, and then you don't want to read uh, Sandworms and Hunters until after you've finished the main series either, anyway. But Sandworms and, and they're... How do I put it? I, I don't want to trash Brian Herbert because I don't think Sandworms and Hunters are like, oh, these are the worst books I've ever written in my read in my life and just set them on fire and burn them. They never happened or existed. Like stomp on them, dump them into the ground and like <laughs> no, I'm not like that. But I don't think they necessarily follow Frank Herbert's vision necessarily. Um, but I don't think they're awful. <sighs> but 
I get, I, I, under, I definitely see why a lot of people are disappointed with him. I definitely understand that. And, you know, my, my, it, it doesn't really, it, it gives you a conclusion, but you might not like the conclusion. And personally, it, it does kind of leave you wanting. It's kind of like, yeah, that's it. It's kind of like, ah, uh, kind of fizzles out compared to what Frank Herbert set up. So that's the only trouble with those books, in my opinion. But, uh, okay, Lucy Lestat, thank you so much for your super chat. Um, you didn't have a question, but thank you so much for your super chat. The support is greatly appreciated. Greatly appreciated. Ah, PB Lipa, you say Momoa would be better as Stilgar. Well, you know we got we got Javier Bardem as Stilgar, so he's I can't think of a better Stilgar than Javier Bardem. I'm like already seeing him as Stilgar. Already seeing him. Already seeing him as Stilgar. Uh it'll be exciting. It'll, and it seems like it seems like everyone's excited. I did see that Josh Brolin video, like I said earlier, where he's on Arrakis. And he seems, Josh Brolin seems like he's really excited for this role. He seems like he's really into it, which is great. Um, we definitely want actors that are into it. I, I Still, I think I'm most nervous about um, Chani, who's being portrayed by Zendaya, and also um, Jess Momoa. Those are the two I'm most... Those are the two that I'm most kind of fearful of. Because, you know, Chani... Chani kind of needs to be this awesome, doesn't take no BS, Fremen badass. So as I mean, I hope Zendaya. I don't want to judge a book by its cover, but she just kind of looks like the pretty girl that's just like she's like I'm pretty, and I hope that's I hope that Chani has a more of a role to play in doing than that. But you know, whatever. And I'll, always like Chani isn't like my favorite character in the Dune books, anyways. But still, like she she she. I don't know if Zendaya is necessarily the best choice to portray the character that is in the book. You know what I mean? But I don't want to hate on it yet. I don't want to hate on it yet, you know? We can hate on it, we can hate on it after it comes out. <laughs> but I'm I'm not I'm not planning on hating. I'm hoping that we can I'm hoping that the book's good and I'm really we're really putting a lot of our trust in Denis Villeneuve, who is I've liked a lot of his films. I I really, I really love Arrival, Blade Runner. 2049 was an excellent film regardless of what some people say some people hate on it but i really like arrival and blade runner um did not like sicario i'm sorry <laughs> i know a lot of you were big fans of denny villeneuve's sicario movie i was not into it it was it stressed me out it was like not the deal for me it was just like not what i needed i couldn't relate to anybody like a <sighs> god damn it gave me not that that kind of movie gives me like stress it fucking gives me panic attacks i can't handle that like it's, but it's interesting that Den denis villeneuve can go from a movie like arrival to sicario and back and forth totally different tones totally different types of films and he's effective in both of them because i know that even though sicario wasn't for me i'm not saying that it wasn't a well-crafted movie he i mean it was a very well-crafted movie and that's part of the reason why it wasn't for me it was too well-crafted and i'm just like uh I, I can't watch this too intense for me um uh, well, George R. R. Martin die after books. It's who writes the Dream of Spring. Well, I don't. I don't think it's 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 fair to be questioning whether or not George R. R. Martin is going to live or die before he finishes his books. You know what I mean? Just let him do what he wants to do, and let's not let's not dwell on any of that. You know what I mean? Let's not dwell on who lives and who dies. You know, the world is sad enough. You know. <laughs> uh, but thank you for your super chat. Uh, dot dot. Uh, Doth Revan, Doth Revan. <laughs> uh, what's what point do you think Frank Herbert was trying to make with the reader constantly by reincarnating Duncan? Well, oh, that's an interesting question too. In some ways, I think that Duncan could just be. In a lot of ways, I feel like Duncan is kind of. In a way, he is the reader almost in some way in, in in certain novels not necessarily each one but i think in the same way that duncan is kind of dropped into the universe of the god emperor with like no knowledge he's just kind of dropped into it and it's just here that's how the reader is kind of just dropped into the universe right god emperor just starts and it's just like oh shit 1500 years later and this guy is ruling the empire what's going on and it's kind of like you're in the same perspective as Duncan. And, and similarly in Heretics of Dune, it's kind of like, 
oh, now it's another 1,500 years later and we're dropped into this universe of scanning Bene Gesserit, Bene Gesserit witches. Who do we trust? Um, but yeah. Oh, Marvin Martin, great question. What was the Bene Gesserit original plan for humanity? If Jessica had obeyed, wouldn't the golden path necessitate the Quisitz Hederic doing what he did anyway? That's an interesting point to bring up because even Leto says to the Bene Gesserit in his message in Heretics of Dune, why did you not create the golden path? You saw the necessity of it. Um, well, from what I can sur surmise from the Bene Gesserit original plan, it was it, w it would have been something similar. But ultimately, I think Leto saw some flaw in the Bene Gesserit plan. Um, so, but it would, it would have been ultimately that they would you, create the Kwisatz Haderach. They would imprint him in whatever ways that they do. And they would use him, use his power, to steer humankind on some kind of path. Now, the, the actual details of what it would have been aren't exactly clear or at least i can't really see exactly what they were doing but i would i, I wouldn't deny that it would have been something similar to what leto the second had to what leto the second did right but ultimately i think the late i think he did see a flaw in in their whole thing and so i think i think that he probably did change their design in a lot of key ways essentially because, it, yeah, ultimately the Bene Gesserit design was to save humanity from ultimately ending. It was to steer humankind on a path that would lead to their ultimate salvation. So it was essentially their own kind of golden path. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. I, I wonder what... what Because I know in Children of Dune, I think, he, Leto mentions that there, were, that there was a flaw in their entire plan. And I can't recall exactly what he says right now, but he does bring up the fact that they were flawed in some way. Uh, but ultimately, ultimately, their design would have been similar is basically down what I'm getting to. Rambling around the question a little bit, but yeah, I hope that answers. Um, VT31008. What is a character that you would like to meet? Well, obviously the God Emperor, right? Can you imagine talking to the God Emperor? That immense weight of wisdom and knowledge, knowledge of the past, knowledge of the future. Um... There'd be so so many questions, so much to ask. Uh, I I I'd, I'd ask him about the origins of life. Uh, in 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 Chapter House of Dune, Odraid mentions that the Bene Gesserit have memories that stretch back to the origins of life. So I can only imagine that the God Emperor does, and I'm pretty sure in that book he does say something like, "The terrible ancestry before consciousness." In the in that in that time. I think he mentioned something like a time between consciousness and non-consciousness or something like that. Like a terrible time. Like he even has memories back to that point. Like when consciousness wasn't even, when consciousness was emerging, when consciousness wasn't finite. Because, God, can you imagine? That's, that's a concept that's kind of hard to grasp, right? A between state between consciousness and non-consciousness. Is there even such a thing? And what, what is that? Uh, uh, but that'd be very, I think I think there'll be a lot of interesting things to ask of the God Emperor, right? And that'd be one of them for me. So I definitely want to talk to the God Emperor. Whew. Could they ever have perceived the golden path without going to the place they dared not go? Isn't that almost intrinsic to the Kwisatz Haderach? Hmm... That's a good point. I don't know. I don't know. see. Maybe maybe that was part of their flaw. Maybe that maybe because they could not look into that place where the Quisatz had erect could, they would never be able to fully see where to leave the golden path. Which is why they was, which is why they needed him. I think a Quisatz had erect to kind of help them plot the golden path and to help them plot their plans for humanity and to help lead them along that path. But the problem was, see, their ultimate their their flaw was thinking that they could control something like that, thinking that they could troll someone that had that knowledge of the future and the past, that could look into a place where they couldn't and had knowledge that they didn't. Knowledge is power. That is a cliche, but knowledge is power. But he, he had, he, by virtue of them creating him, he had power over them, necessarily. So uh, their ultimate mistake was thinking that they could control that.
I think the large difference between the Bene Gesserit and Leto says Arya Ili, Ia, Arya says that Leto the second. It says, okay, let me start over. I think that a large difference between the Bene Gesserit and Leto the second is probably that the Bene Gesserit are too cautious and are too quick to seek to and are too quick to seek control, while Leto sees absolute control as illusory. Okay, yeah. That's a good point. Um, I love... Uh, good point, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I mostly agree with that. I, I doubt that most people... Ah, oh, yeah, Wyvernstone, that's a good point. So Wyvernstone just said, I doubt that most people could even understand what Leto was saying to them until much later in their lives. Leto laid lessons for the person and the people. Yeah, so that's the thing about Leto. I, I that's the thing. Like I, I imagine having a conversation with Leto would be you go to him, he says something to you, and you're left going, What? But the thing that he said to you probably like planted seeds in your subconscious that will sprout at some distant future point in your life and will affect you in profound ways that you could have never seen before. And that, and that would just be the power of this like grand, almost divine force, right? So, uh, so yeah, I can, I can only imagine what it would have been like to talk to Leto the second. And I think I think the next best best thing would have been Frank Herbert. Apparently, speaking to him was like a, he was a great orator. And I've 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 listened to the the um, the the few recorded um, speeches that he has on um, interviews on speeches that he has on YouTube. There's a very interesting one where he's speaking at college. I took some clips from it from one of my videos, and it was a very interesting guy. This was in the '80s, I think. And the guy was very angry. He was asking Frank Herbert the question. He brings up the Baron, the portrayal of the Baron in Dune, which is something that I've been asked about as well. Uh, the Baron's sexuality. And the guy was very upset. And he was saying that Frank Herbert was... That it was irresponsible of Frank Herbert to portray the Baron as a gay guy and have that be the only representation of a gay guy in the book. I don't necessarily see it that way. I kind of view it as like... It's not it's not necessarily he's a homosexual. It's like look at this extreme insane decadence, right? That's that's the, that's the idea. He's he's grossly overweight because he's extremely decadent in fact. He's got and it, it's it's like he takes too much. It's 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 gluttony. It's like it's like horrifying gluttony, right? That's 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 the deal behind the bear and that's the point of it. Now and you know it, it's very easy to like I I, I guess kind of see through that. Especially in this modern political climate, but I thought that was interesting, considering that it was from the '80s. It was like '85, I think, when he did that interview. So, it's kind of interesting that that was even that was something that someone brought up then. Yeah, he's ex exactly right. He's a decadent pedo monster. Like I, 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 I don't think ever reading the book that I saw, I don't think I ever really thought of the Baron as even gay. Right? I thought of him as just like a sick, <laughs> monstrous pedophile right that's 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 the way i thought of him so that's that's and that's an interesting thing about an interesting thing about perceptions too um i think for some it, it all depends on where, where you are in life and the lens you view things too it's all about perception you know the way you see it yes yes brian ben, brennan it, brian ben just said the beto was overweight because of an s take an STD given to him when he conceived Jessica. And that is a tidbit from the Brian Herbert work. So I don't want to spoil it if you haven't read it, but like that that's an interesting bit. And I, I, I tend to, I like that idea. That's one of the ideas that I, I like. Like the Bene Gesserit, um, because the Baron, they, 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 they needed his DNA, right? But, like, because he was such an asshole about it, they gave him this disease that made him, like, fat and gross. <laughs> so that, that's, that's the deal in the Brian Herbert books. But I know some people have a problem with whether or not that's canon or not. So that's the deal with that. All right, so I want to talk about Heretics of Dune a little bit more. So in, in Heretics of Dune, we, we also, another 
group of people that we see a little bit cl more closely are the Tleilaxu. And it's interesting because the Tleilaxu... The Tleilaxu are kind of almost an alien race, right? It's all because they're they're so they're, they love their isol, isol, isolationism, they love their xenophobia. So they and not just not just physically, but it's also genetically. So you have like the masters who are like they've got like pointy ears and sharp teeth and like little claws and they, they look like little elves, right? And that's because they're so genetically isolated. And it's interesting to see their culture right out the front. Because people always say, oh, there are no aliens in the Dune universe. But I'm like, the Tleilaxu are kind of the closest thing to aliens that we're going to get. The Tleilaxu and, uh, I guess, the Guild Navigators, perhaps. Even though they're both technically human. They can breed with anyone else. But the Tleilaxu, they're an interesting bunch. They're an interesting bunch. So in Heretics of Dune, it's revealed that, or at least... The Tleilaxu don't see themselves as as bad as everyone else sees them. And from Wolf's perspective, they've been actively trying to kind of make themselves be viewed as bad. Or at least that's what they tell themselves. That's what they tell themselves, right? They tell themselves that, um, oh, we're not as bad as they view us as. And we're just trying to make them think we're bad, even though their actions kind of even their internal actions from within Wap's own mind. He's very willing to kill to get what they want. So they, they it's very it's very obvious that they are kind of immoral hypocrites, even though they see themselves as these kind of like pious beings that are above everyone else. But in, like when from inside Wap's mind, you can very really clearly see that he kind of only cares about himself and that he's willing to kill to get what he wants and he's not and that they are kind of just as despicable as they as they've ever as the way the universe saw them they are really that despicable the female toilaxu who have not been seen because they are all clones well yeah well, spoiler well female toilaxu they are the axolotl tanks so at, at some point in toilaxu history um women it was decided that women you know we don't need you anymore and it's like we're gonna we're gonna turn all these women into basically breeding tanks and they're just basically female uh, duncan describes when he sees a vision of his birth he just he describes gross female flesh so you can only like imagine just kind of mutated women hooked up to machines uh, and their sole purpose is to produce whatever those Tleilaxu who want them to produce. And I would wonder how, and it's interesting, I wonder how spice is produced from within an axolotl tank because I, I, can, I can kind of wrap my head around how a gola, a child, is produced from an axolotl tank, but how do you make spice in an axolotl tank? That's like really out there. I'd love like some information on how that's done. But that's the thing about Frank Herbert. He doesn't like, it's never really about the technology with Frank Herbert. It's always more about the implications of it. Um, kind of, it's always about you know the implications of the technology. What does this mean for humanity? What does this mean for people and their behavior and society and culture? You know, it's not. It's, ne it's never about how it works, right? Which is what. And the axolotl tanks is something that we will discuss more on this channel because in Chapter House of in Chapter House of Dune, the Bene Gesserit get their own axolotl tanks, and like I mentioned earlier, it was kind of something that they were forced to do out of necessity and it's kind of like something that they have to reconcile reconcile but it's pragmatism how many parts do you think the movie will be well well definitely the first movie is two parts uh from every indication that i've seen the new dune movie um uh, it's two parts um so what i'm thinking is that it's gonna uh, i agree danica um comic book girl 19 she she thinks that it's gonna end Paul, Jessica going to the desert, Jessica drinks the water of life, spice orgy, around that time. And I, I tend Ellie is born and maybe, you know, maybe, or yeah. Around that time. So that's that that seems like where it's gonna end, because in the book it's also like it skips several years after that point, and then like Ali is like up and running, and then Paul has a kid, and then like Paul is getting ready to challenge Stilgar. So I'm thinking that they're gonna do two parts. It's it, no. It seems like they're doing two parts. It seems like from Denny Villeneuve, he's 
the, every indication is given that we're going to do two parts. And that's everything that I've seen has said two parts. So it's not three, it's two. But I, they're definitely going to have to rearrange some things. And I definitely think they're going to have to flesh out some of the action a little bit more because it, that's it's it's needed for cinematic purposes. Not Dune isn't necessarily lacking in action. It's just that the action is behind the scenes. It takes a back seat to the philosophy and you know to all the other stuff that's going on, to the plans within plans and all the plots and stuff like that. So it takes a back seat, but it's it's there. It's there. Dune Messiah could definitely be do, done with one movie, but honestly, I could I could see them. Combining Dune and Children, combining Messiah and Children of Dune, and I don't know if that would necessarily be the best move because uh, there's they're, they're such a big jump in time. But Dune Messiah is not really—it's such a weird little story, right? It's not really a typical like kind of narrative. So it, the Dune Messiah, I feel like they'd have a really difficult time translating that into a novel right novel not novel trans translating that novel into an into a book right I, god damn it what am i i can't talk i i literally just said translating that novel into a book uh translating that novel into a movie i feel like they, they'd have a more difficult time translating dune messiah than dune even though dune is bigger and has more going on just because dune messiah doesn't necessarily follow like a normal narrative structure it's like our hero in the end walks out into the desert and dies. I don't think that's necessarily a sad, will be a satisfying ending for like most moviegoers. But yeah, we'll see. It depends on it depends on who who's doing it though, and it depends on how how well. It, it, but some it, but it depends on how much they change. Some stuff has to be changed. I I think. Some stuff needs to be added, mixed around, moved around. You know, it's not. It's not like I'm expecting the book on screen because that's literally impossible. Leto did not have the right to alter human genetics the way he did. Ah, so you're using the Siona argument, are you? Uh, so that, that's an interesting question about rights. Um, because uh, it's, a, it's such an interesting philosophical quandary, right? Like, because what gave Leto that right? You're right. He didn't. He didn't. But, I mean, he would say that by the fact that he is a god, the closest thing to a god that men have ever seen, that, and by virtue of him seeing further and further behind than anyone else has, that he does have that right. That would be his argument. His argument would be, like, he is the one that is doing what's necessary to save humanity. But, yeah, ultimately, ultimately, I would agree with you. He didn't have the right. And I think ultimately he might actually end up agreeing with you. Maybe he didn't have the right and maybe that's the point. Maybe he's trying to make us see that he doesn't have the right. No one has that right. And he and maybe he's trying to make sure that you see... Maybe he's trying to make sure that you never, ever, ever give anyone that right. Which we should never do. We should never do. We should always question our leaders. We should always question our leaders. And, you know, even in the real world, definitely, definitely, definitely in the real world. See, that's the thing that people don't get about Dune, too, is that it's it's not just, it's not, it's not just space witches and guild navigators and Kwisatz Hatteraks and sandworms. You know, it, it, it's a reflection of our own society and our own cultures and our own people. It's, it's a reflection of humanity. It's a warning and a lesson to humanity. And yes, it is fiction, but we can find the kernels of truth within this fiction and find the meaningful bits and find ways to take those kernels of truth out into the real world and steer ourselves on a better path you know that's what frank kerb was trying to teach us and i and i and i think it, it's a very valuable lesson because a lot of times people fall in love with leaders Right, and it's almost like that leader can do no wrong. You, you fall in love with that leader, and the moment anyone says anything that's in opposition to that person, that leader that you put up on this pedestal, pedestal, you revolt, and it's because you're worshiping this leader as almost as as a god, which you shouldn't. You should always question your leaders. You should always question your charismatic leader 
no matter what, no matter how good their record is, no matter the 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 platitudes and nice things that they say, and no matter all of it, you should always question them. And I think that's ultimately the point. Yes, yes, bright glory. We have to see through the cult of personality. And, you know, that's a very important thing with politics. And I'm not I'm not going to get political, but I'm just saying, no matter what po- side of the political spectrum that you're on. Feel like you should always you should never just take what a politician says to you as at face value you should look at what they've done in the past look at what they've said in the past look at what they're doing now and just really 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 question them and you know at the, at the crux of it frank herbert was in the political system he wrote speeches for po- politicians literally so he was in there he understood how it works and so he he put a lot of his knowledge from being around politicians and being in Washington. He put all that knowledge into Dune and he said, you know what, I'm gonna show you how it really works. I'm gonna show you how it really goes down. I'm gonna show you why you really can't trust what these people are saying most of the time. It's like Aaliyah in Children of the Dune. She's possessed by the Baron. Uh, she's literally possessed by the Baron trying to destroy trying to destroy all spice on Arrakis. And it's like, even though that's ultimately what Leto the Second did, but, but you know, that's not the point. <laughs> but the, yeah question leaders that's the main point of the story that's the, that that's that it's the crux of it the whole main issue <laughs> michael um cr- i can't say your last name i'm so sorry um but michael says <laughs> i believe the saying goes fiction is social commentary of our existence and i definitely agree with that statement it definitely is or at least, or at least good fiction is the social commentary of our existence all right, that's why I, I think I, I'm bored by a lot of a lot of things that are that some people are interested in a lot of the really popular like movies and stuff, because it's just like what is what is this teaching me? What is this saying about us and humankind and the human condition? What is this really saying? Like I feel like if if you're gonna make a piece of art, a a movie or a book, or you're gonna write a book. Your goal shouldn't just be inter- to entertain, but to teach, and 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 you should you should write about the human struggle. That's the only thing that's worth writing about. Your your writing should reflect us. At least at least that's what I think. And and I I am not super into the stuff that's just like oh, Avengers Endgame. Not not saying that that I I don't enjoy like the Marvel stuff, but I'm just like everyone's just obsessed with those movie movies, and I'm just like. Yeah, but it's just kind of, kind of hollow. At the end of the day, it's kind of hollow. I mean, I guess I, I guess Thanos kind of has a philosophy, kind of like a balance and whatever, yada yada yada. But it's kind of vague. It's kind of vague when you get down to it, and it's kind of also been there, done that when you get down to it. So it's like, yeah, what are you really saying? And out of all the Marvel movies, I feel like probably Captain America: Winter Soldier. Kind of that was the one that I was like, wow, that one did a really good job of actually saying something important, right? Like that was the one that was like it, it actually had a lot to say about like government surveillance and like privacy and stuff like that. So I was really into that one. But then most of them I'm just I'm just kind of like, well, say, say something and say something to me. Say something to me. And I feel the same way about, you know, Star Wars or like a lot of the other really popular stuff. You know, that's why I was really excited that Villeneuve is the one that's doing Dune because I had seen Arrival and Arrival was just like, oh my God, it was everything that I love about science fiction. Ever, ever since like I fell in love with Star Trek and Picard and like the Twilight Zone and like every, it was everything that I love about science fiction because it was mystery. And it, and it was it was it was it was telling us something about humankind and human nature, and it was it was it was just like it was it was unique, it was different, it was just like ah, that's what we need, that's what the world needs, and I feel like Dune is great right now because Dune is a series that totally subverts like just the typical ideas of like how a story is told, and it like totally subverts. Well, the, the first book it it hooks you in. And then the rest of the book, the rest of the series is meant to totally subvert everything that you've been taught and to teach you that the fuck it, 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 the first book introduces you to the illusion and the, and the rest of them teach you to see through the illusion. That's how I would describe them. It teaches you to see through the illusion and to see how it really goes down. 
So Marvin, Marvin, you are so generous. Thank you so much for your super chat. Uh, what was Frank Herbert's point with preborn? Aaliyah, anti-aging is a sign of possession. But in thousands of years, there would surely have been other secret immortals for no reason than simple human nature. Hmm. Okay, so that seems like a multifaceted question. I don't know if if Elias. Okay, so in Children of Dune, right? Elias' anti-aging wasn't necessarily a sign of possession, right? It was a sign that she really didn't have any respect for the Bene Gesserit tenants. Well, I get what I get. What I guess as as virtue of that, that could kind of be a sign of possession, or it could it, or she's kind of I don't know. But it, it's, I don't think the fact that she was doing that is necessarily a sign of possession because if you remember in God Emperor of Dune, that's what the, the average Bene Gesserit are doing, right? They're, they're doing that because like they don't have access to spies, so they're kind of like doing it to themselves so they can live longer. So it's not necessarily a sign of possession. But on the point of wouldn't there surely have been other secret immortals for no other reason than simple human nature? I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean, right? Um, I'm not under sure. I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean. So, so Ilya was keeping herself young by virtue of Bene Gesserit Prana Bindu skills, which allowed them to just kind of rearrange their inner workings, and she can just kind of maintain that youthfulness in a way that the average person never could which didn't really relate back to her being pre-born necessarily. So if you could just clarify that, I will, I'll be happy to answer it. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. <sighs> uh, Carson, Carson Golden says, I think Duncan Idaho is the most tortured character in the book. I think for sure. I think for sure, and I think we do see that too. What when Duncan, when his memories are reawakened, and he sees himself die over and over and over again, because that's the thing he remembers that. So as far as he's concerned, that happened to him. So yeah, but ultimately, I think Duncan, Duncan, but Leto, Leto the second as well. I I, I feel like it, they're they're contenders. Leto the second is 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 very tortured as well because because it, it's like. To live 4,000 years and then never have sex. <laughs> so that, that's one thing. You, like, they never feel the touch of another person, right? I mean, that's, that's, that, that, that's tough. That's, 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 some tough, that's some tough stuff, right? It's like from the time that he's a child, it's just like, now I'm locked into this, this path. And it's like, it's not, it's not just that he can't touch another person. It's like... He can see the path. He can see it clearly. So it's like boredom. Oh, just like infinite boredom. And then you can just, so that all there really is to do is to like lapse back into his other memories. So yeah, Leto and Leto and Duncan, I feel like they, they kind of share. They share the role of probably most conflicted character. Not conflicted character, but most tortured character. Yeah, that's a good point, our um, Wixel. Uh, good point about um, the Brian Herbert ending. Thank you so much, Kyle Elder. Thank you so much for your kind comments. Okay, oh, that's a good question, Tracy Bolden. Uh, Tracy Bolden says, I never really understood how Aaliyah could have the Baron in her head as she is female, um, could she have both lines of her heritage? Well, you see, this is a, this is kind of a, a misunderstanding in Dune. I think it, it's kind of, it's a little bit Frank Herbert's fault because of some of the wording in the earlier Dune book, but it's, it's kind of more understood in the later Dune books. Basically, the way other memory works is that it's not necessarily that you don't have access to your male ancestors. It's that you don't have access to your paternal memories so she could she can't see leto the second she can't see leto's memories not leto she can't she can't see her father the duke leto's memories she can't see his mother's memory she can't see his grandmother's memories. she can't see his grandfather's memories but she can see leto's 
She can see Jessica's father's memories, the Baron's mother's memories. The ba so it's like she can see the maternal side, not necessarily the paternal side. So, do you, so that does that make sense? So it's not necessarily that they can't see the male ancestors. They can't look into the paternal side. So yeah, but that, that's that's actually clarified um, in the later books a little bit more. And that's a, that's a question that a lot of people bring up because it's not exactly clear um, early on. It's not exactly it's not exactly super clear early on, but Frank does flesh it out, flesh it out as the books continue. As an author and a retired teacher, says Augustus eighty seven Heron. As an author and a retired teacher, I just wanted to express my appreciation for your love of a good story. Your ability to point out interesting facets of this beloved work brings me much joy. Thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, thank you guys so much for your support and joining me on this stream today. Uh, it's been great. Um, if you've been enjoying the stream so far, um, please feel free to leave a like. It really, really helps out with the streams um, because it makes it easier for people to see the streams later on. Because YouTube always does weird stuff with streams like it'll kind of hide it for a little bit. So by you guys liking it here, it really helps the channel out and it really helps the video be seen later on, you know, for rewatchability purposes and whatnot. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Murder the like button. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So yeah, so um yeah, I want I wanted to talk about a little bit before I go here. I wanted to talk about um just like some of the technical stuff that went into my ultimate guide to Heretics of Dune. Uh so m that just went up about 5 days ago and so far it's my favorite episode that I've done so far just because of the way that I was able to do things with the editing that I wasn't able to do in the other episodes and I feel like it looks aesthetically better than any other episode that I've done so far. Um, so the first episode that I ever did, um, the part one, the introduction, that was like one of the bi biggest projects that I had ever done at the time. And I thought that was difficult. But even that when there's like some mistakes in it, there's obvious mistakes in pronunciation. There are some mistakes in the text. Um, and I was kind of new to some of the effects that I was using. And you know, and so that one, that one, I, I still like that video a lot. And then the second one, the the one that's just Dune, the first Dune book, that one was, I, I went less on the visuals and more just kind of like on breaking down the story. So that one, that one, that one is kind of, I guess I would call that one the least impressive as far as the editing. And then we have the Dune Messiah one, which is kind of my least favorite one. And not because it's edited poorly, but just because I go back and I look at my Dune Messiah Ultimate Guide and I feel like I could have done more exposition. I just like go into that one and I'm just like, oh, I could have said this here and I could have done that there. So that one's like, ah, uh, iffy. But I really like the way I edited it and the way I had like the the characters' faces showing up and like I kind of, I, I was kind of putting you in the scene. I really like the way I did that. So I did transfer that element over to the Children of Dune video which personally I feel like is the most underrated of the ultimate guides because that one I feel like I, I, I that one was the children of Dune ultimate guide that I did that was the closest video to my original design up until that point to what I originally had wanted to do with this series as far as like making it look nice and editing editing it really well and just like that was like the closest to my original design and then when God Emperor came out I couldn't do because I was planning on like really going in with God Emperor and doing a lot of like really fancy fancy editing stuff but at the time that I was editing it my computer was dying like my my, my desktop was dying like my desktop was about four or five years old at that point and it was just like not having it anymore and it was the biggest project that I ever done an hour and 40 minutes long it kept crashing and I was like, I just cannot do all the stuff that I actually want to put in this episode and I can't have all these different layers because it's going to significantly slow down the process and my computer's going to keep crashing. So I had to make some sacrifices with that episode, but I made sure that the narration was really good and that the text was really good and that I did the right amount of exposition. 
but with heretics. I was so excited because I got a brand new computer last year and I was able to really, really edit the heck out of this one. And I was at, I was able to put like have the faces coming up and I was able to have like moving backgrounds and multi layers and make it seem multi-dimensional and like really illustrate it when they were on different places. I really wanted to give Gamu a certain look and I really wanted to give Arrakis a certain look. So when I cut scenes that you would know exactly where I was, you would know that this is Gamu, this is Chapter House, um, this is Rackus. So I feel like I was able to do so many things in Heretics of Dune that I wasn't able to do before. And I'm very proud of it. And I hope you all check it out if you haven't yet. And yeah, it is, it is very exciting. It's very exciting to get it out. And I was very excited to get, see everyone's reaction. Um, I'm so happy that you guys have really liked it. I'm so happy that you guys really love my Dune content. It's It's been such a blessing. It's been such so great to come on here and to be able to talk about Dune. You guys have no idea how much of a wonderful outlet this has been for me uh, to just to express my love just for like nerdy science fiction and nerdy fantasy and yeah and i hope you guys uh continue to stay subscribed and of course a crap ton more dune content coming in the future as always and even more stuff coming this year like hyperion um i've got some hyperion videos co coming up by dan simmons i've got more foundation stuff coming up um we've got some wheel of time comparison videos coming up in the future where we're going to be comparing the Bene Gesserit to the um, to the Aes Sedai from the Wheel of Time, who I feel are based on the Bene Gesserit. So a lot of interesting things coming up for you guys in, in the future. So it's just been great. And yeah, that's what I want to say. Got another super chat from you, Marvin Martin. Dude, you are loaded. Don't have you think, but th thank you so much for the super chat. You guys have no idea um, how much this helps. Uh, I mean, what is Frank Herbert trying to say? I was waiting on you. I mean, what is Frank Herbert trying to say with pre-birth? Um, an indefinite life is too big a temptation for any doctrine, but is Aaliyah the only one? B.S. Well, when it comes to pre-birth, it's not... No, okay, see, my interpretation of it, the reason that Aaliyah succumbed to possession was... It was due to the fact that she, a child who possessed no real selfdom, no real individuality, had other identities forced upon her, which clouded her own awareness, her own sense of self. And it, she, she succumbed to the sea of other presences. And I don't think George R. R. Martin is making a statement about. I don't. I don't think he's making a statement about like the will, about necessarily will. All right. It's it's. Frank Herbert was trying to say with pre-birth, an indefinite life is too big a temptation for any doctrine, but also Leah, Aaliyah is the only one. I don't think. See, I don't think Aaliyah succumbed to possession due to the fact that. Um, she was tempted for and she was tempted to have an eternal life or she was tempted to have an indefinite life that wasn't the reason she succumbed to possession she succumbed to possession because she didn't she couldn't maintain her own individuality in the sea of other consciousnesses and i think this is due in some part because of the fact that jessica abandoned her on arrakis and didn't help and that the reason that and largely the reason that Leto the Second and Ganema were able to overcome the possession was because of the fact that they had each other. They were able to rely on each other. While Celia, she had no one. And when in in the instances where she had no one, the Baron saw an opportunity. That that ego inside of her stepped forward and said, "I will help you." I don't. I don't think. It, I don't think she was possessed because of a out of a temptation to extend her life. Is what I'm saying. Um, if many Jesuit don't love, why care about humanity? Um, good point. And that's kind of the point of, um, uh, that's kind of the point of heretics, isn't it? And that's kind of the point that, uh, that Odrade come, that's kind of the understanding that she comes to in the end of heretics. So in the beginning, you're presented with this, with, from Odrade's perspective, she's saying that the Bene Jesuit do not love. We've been taught not to love. Remember that woman's pain, yada, yada, yada. 
But in the end of it, what does she say? She says to Duncan, I feel what I feel. Noble purpose. Leto said to them, what is, what is life? What is survival if you no longer hear the music of life? If you're no longer called to noble purpose? And I think, I think that in the end, Odraid saw through that. And she saw that, you know, maybe love is crippling, but they can't suppress it. And, and I think she saw that she couldn't suppress it, and the many Jesuits shouldn't suppress it. So that's that's my own personal interpretation, and I know that some of you might have some different interpretations of that, but that's the way I interpreted it. Forget possession. I'm asking why Aaliyah is the only one who goes for immortality. Well, she's not. She's not. Uh, Irulan as well. Irulan does it as well in Children of Dune. Does she not? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Irulan does it as well. It's uh, I, I, yeah. Ir Irulan is doing yeah. Uh, and I, I, I think you mean what is Frank Herbert trying to say about um, possession, about pre-birth in a broader spectrum? Is 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 what I think you mean? And yeah, and uh, but to answer your other part of the question too. Um, Aaliyah is not necessarily beholden to Bene Gesserit tenets, right? So she, she's kind of heretical in that way, right? So she kind of doesn't care. The, the Bene Gesserit seem greatly conditioned against this. Like they are told early on like that this will destroy us. Like doing this will lead to our destruction. And when it comes to Aaliyah, I don't think she really cares. I think she's just kind of like, whatever, I don't care. I'm not, I'm not a Bene Gesserit. And so I think that's her whole deal. And so and when it comes to pre-birth, you're, you're asking me, what, what does it mean, I guess, in the broader theme of what Frank Herbert is trying to say? Um, uh, let me think, let me think, let me think. Okay. Um, it could be a statement on individuality and needing to be a person before you offer up in other entities into yourself. Because you, you have like normal reverend mothers who go through immense amount of training and um, immense amount of training and, and, and they, have, they have to hone their skills significantly before they can undergo the spice agony and bring these other presences into themselves. And Aaliyah being preborn, she kind of, or anyone being preborn, it's kind of like, it's kind of like what is what is what is self when when you're born with other memories right what are you really like what are you but a conglomeration of a bunch of other things i, I mean i think it's 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 kind of amazing that Aaliyah had any kind of personality uh considering the fact that she was born with other minds living inside of herself Right, so I, I feel like it could be a statement on... Elia's whole struggle is kind of a statement on individuality and, and being trapped by your past. and It's a, dif it's a difficult subject to tackle. I don't want to ramble on it because I, I, don't, I, don't know if, I don't know if I actually have a clear answer. I don't know if I can actually clearly answer this question. It's a very difficult one because you're asking me about like the broader theme and the idea of of pre-birth as a whole and it's something that I need to like actually contemplate for hours before I can actually definitively say or definitively definitively give you a conclusion on what I think Frank Herbert was meaning here oh I don't feel like I'm giving a really great answer but yeah yeah James James Bross I like what you just said pre-birth you must know yourself or, after, or else you will have no identity Therefore, the pre-born pre will succumb to possession. Yeah, that, that's kind of what I'm trying to say, right? Yeah, that's kind of what I'm trying to say. I don't want to sound like an idiot here. <laughs> Normal was something else entirely. All right, guys. So, yeah, I I'm glad we had this talk. I'm glad we had this talk, all right? So, thank you, thank you, Marvin Martin. I hope I answered your question to some extent. Um... We can talk about this more. If you have a Twitter, feel free to message me on Twitter. Um, and we can kind of like, we can go back and forth on Twitter. We can maybe figure this out, you and me, because I think that's a very 
interesting concept and interesting idea to think about like what 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 is he trying to say in a broader scale um yeah but thank you guys so much for joining in joining in with me and listening to me talk about dune it's been great i love you guys you guys are always supportive uh like the stream and uh subscribe if you're not already subscribed it's been a pleasure thank you guys so much Peace out.